When I started working in sustainable energy in 1985, just half a mile from here over in Bedminster, there was no prospect whatsoever that this photo could ever be taken in the UK. And for these children, that wind turbines will be potentially as normal a part of the landscape in their adult lives as pylons are for anyone who was born since the 1950s. Those are symbols of promise and utility of a better future. So what I want to try and talk about is how did that happen? The campaigns that were running around electricity privatization in 1989 were successful because we, Friends of the Earth, others, many others, and people like Tony Blair, were pushing at a door that all the other people were trying to open. That secured a very, very modest, but first ever, target for renewable energy in the UK. Now, a few years later, largely in response to the wave of renewable energy entrepreneurship that these new arrangements had unleashed, that target doubled. Now, twice, not very much, is still not very much, but it created a legitimacy. It set the seeds, it set the, found the, the foundations and a space for renewable energy to emerge. In 1985, a renewable energy investment company called the Wind Fund, which is now Triodos Renewables, emerged alongside people like Bay Wind Energy Co-op, provide opportunities for the public to invest in renewable energy projects, take a direct stake in a low carbon renewable energy future. This was the original crowdfunding. It was pre-internet, but it was still direct investment in change for the crowd in that it set minimum investment levels at rates that most people could afford, a few hundred pounds. Since then, Triodos Renewables, and I know a number of you have visited the stand, has since grown to a £30 million investment fund with more than 50 megawatts of capacity. And most importantly, from my perspective as the chair of the board of Triodos Renewables, more than 5,000 individuals investing to take a stake. These aren't venture capitalists and corporate raiders. These are people of modest means using their funds to stimulate change and to stimulate the change they believe in. So we've got a massive target of the way we need to change our energy system, and we've got a nearer-term target of how much renewables need to play in that. So if we've got that, why does it still feel like we're not quite on the right path? One of the reasons is because we're not very good at seeing the gains we've made. We forget that in 1985, there was no prospect of any of this being the case. We're rather bad at standing back and seeing these little incremental steps to a dominant approach which isn't any longer fit for purpose, for one which has lost touch with the public it's meant to be serving. So why do we need the people involved? Why do we need their meaningful consent and purposeful involvement? There's three reasons. One is the people pay for it. We are all paying through our energy bills and through our taxes for the changes that are going on in the energy system. That needs our consent. People host much of it in their communities, in their homes, in their businesses. People need to do it themselves. We need behaviour change, we need to accept things, we need to be involved. And because we live in a democracy, we need to provide the political space to be controlled, cajoled, encouraged, convinced into making those changes. We've been running a project at the Centre for Sustainable Energy uh, called Plan Local that's been trying out some approaches to do it. We start from the premise that every community has a duty to make a contribution appropriate to their locality to the collective national effort to cut emissions and change the energy system. There's two questions that we think about in relation to this. The first one is the normal question that gets asked by government, and they continue to do it. What are you going to do about climate change? Somehow it's your fault, and when you ask people that, they find an, a, an excuse for it being someone else's problem. They talk about China, they talk about why the government needs to act, and they talk about Jeremy Clarkson. But if you ask a different question, which is actually trying to get to exactly the same answer, how, are we best make our, how can we best make our contribution to a low carbon future around here? You can get a completely different response because it embeds a sense of agency and a proportionality. It's not saying you've got to sort out the whole problem. It's saying, what can we do around here? We together, not you, someone else. When you do this in a meeting, people start exploring options and understanding impacts, costs and benefits. They discuss their own perspectives of the local landscape, the built heritage. They start to understand and talk about the trade-offs that very simply are between preserving a view and exploiting a renewable energy resource. They start also, very interestingly, talking about how they can be part of the delivery of those 
changes rather than have them done to them and start to accumulate the benefits at a local level. That's what we can achieve together. I'll leave you with a quote from Paul Hawkin, the occasionally controversial environmentalist who summed it up nicely. He said, when asked if I'm pessimistic or optimistic about the future, my answer is always the same. If you look at the science about what is happening on the earth and you aren't pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this earth and the lives of the poor and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. Thank you very much.